ego actually comes really into play big time for people. But the reality is it's, it's very similar to trying to grow, for example, a venture startup too fast or things like that. And you take on too much capital, for example, at the very beginning, you're going to just give away more equity. It's real. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard, and with me today, I have Brandon Blum. Brandon, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Many of the people that listen to our shows are big readers like myself. So I want to start off our conversation by talking about a book you're reading now, or at least that you read recently. And that's a book called The Way of the Superior Man. You recently tweeted about it. What were your biggest takeaways from this book? Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was an interesting question you asked me because um, I was assuming you were going to want a list of real estate books, which I've got a great set. But that was basically more of a personal stuff of just of just um, you know how you frame you know go into relationships or or hold your power and things like that and just things around. Um, you know, relationships, whether it be romantic relationships or friendships and things like that, and just kind of making sure that you're always centered and in alignment with sort of like, you know, what makes you the happiest, what you're the best at, and sort of living life the way that you should be living it in your highest and best self versus, you know, you get caught up every day in, you get caught up in a lot of things. I mean, you can get caught up in you know, why, you know, you're trying to make the most money. Well, why, you know, and sometimes people can get very unhappy, even if they're making a lot of money, because they're not in alignment, for example, with their with their best self, and what they're best at what they love to do, and and how they want to contribute and give back to the world. So it, I read that kind of just as like a reset um, recently, and, and a few good reminders. And yeah, the Twitter post I gave you was a really cool quote on something that they called impeccability, which is, which is that impeccability is, you know, being in alignment on a daily basis, you know, of how you want to spend your time. Cause obviously time is our most finite resource that we have as people. And it's, it's just essentially all we have and, and how you spend it is everything. And it's all that matters. And, and so that's uh that's what that was about. I personally highly, re highly recommend, highly recommend it for that reason. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to check it out. I love books. I love reading. I actually have a decent sized collection. I have like 300 books in my personal little library. And I even, I wrote my own book as well with Simon and Schuster. So I'm definitely a big book fan, but I often find myself kind of going back and forth between reading and doing. Like if I have an hour to spend, I think to myself, I probably spend like five minutes, 10 minutes of it thinking, all right, do I want to read for this hour? Or do I want to like open up my computer and actually get some work done? How often are you reading and how do you buy it? And how do you balance a dynamic like this? Uh, I think it's a really tough question. And I think that's gonna, that's very different uh, based on what someone's objectives are, right? Um, I think that when you're starting out, I think that time is is harder to, 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 to get. And over time, as your business grows, you might be, if, if you can staff your company efficiently and build the right processes, you can buy more time. And then, and then success looks like, how can I put the right people in the right seats in the right place? And how do I acquire more information so that I can create improved strategies to, to move my business life, et cetera, forward. And, and you can buy more time and you can work smarter, not harder. So sort of a vague answer to your question, but it, I, I think that, that the real answer, the practical answer to your question is how do you, uh, what are your goals, right? And so how, and what are your goals and how do you measure it? And is your goal to flip a house, uh, you know, and, and, and what is your knowledge base to get there? And, you know, what knowledge do you need to get there? And what resources do you need? And, uh, and what, you know, what are you missing to get to that goal? And, um, that's kind of how you want to do it. And I think that it's really important to not always be in the hamster wheel of the doing and always, always be setting out a certain amount of time to be focused on learning subjects that you think would relate to things that you want to learn, understand, you know, whatever. Um, I don't think reading has to be as vague as people make it. My view is I like to, I like to be very specific. I like to read things that apply to number one, things I'm very interested in. And I like to find things that I think that I could be good at or, or 
and, and, and just sort of read and try to get through my blind spots. Um, I don't think there's a formula at all that relates to how much time you should be spent reading versus doing during the day. I think that you have to break down what your income goals are and you have to build a plan to get there. And your plan, reading could actually be part of your plan. What are you reading and how much time are you spending learning so you're not in the business, you're working on the business, for example, and how much time are you doing that? And then what are the things you don't know that you need to know? I think that's a really simple way to put it. It's like, what don't you know? And what do you need to know to move your life or business forward and kind of write those things down and say, I'm going to spend an hour a day or whatever reading and learning those things so that I, I can continue to improve the do because I think what people get caught into caught up in uh, many times is they're just doing but there's just more efficient ways to do things and just because you're working hard doesn't mean you're working intelligently so the goal with reading is really how can I constantly improve so that I can work more efficiently and effectively um, you know that's really what you're doing what have been some of the most impactful books that you've read Oh man, I've read so many. Um, I've read so many books. Um, you know, with the internet, I, I don't read as many books as I used to, and I, I'm more, I'm more, um, um, you know, when I do read a book, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more focused on what content I'm reading throughout the book because the internet's just so robust now with information between what you can find on twitter on youtube on google i mean you can really it's just it's really incredible um that if you're if you're resourceful you can learn anything and really reach out to anyone um it's just it's 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 amazing it's an amazing time in that way especially to be an entrepreneur you really just have all resources at your fingertips no matter where where you're at as long as you have an internet connection and you you really do the only the only limiting factor for you could be resourcefulness um that said few great books. Um, Ray Dalio principles, really, really unbelievable book. I think as of recent that I read, um, you know, really outlines his journey of successes and failures and the principles that he personally created to eliminate more failures as he moved forward and built one of the biggest hedge funds, um, in the world. And, um, it's real, it's, it was really a unique book and everyone can build different principles based on, um, uh, what their goals are and what their personal life experiences are, but, but it really helps you really think through like, you know, what, what did I really learn from this? I mean, how, how do I turn this failure into more success? And that's really where the learning is, right? The learning is not in, generally not in the successes. The learning is always in, in, in the failures and every failure that you learn and, 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 and throw yourself into, that's just really how you propel yourself. So what he, that, that's one great lesson and figuring out how to turn failure into all a positive and not let it break you and let it let and let growth happen from that, not just personally, but both professionally. I mean, you only go down when you, you know, when you start have to start from scratch and, you know, whatever. I mean, there's just ways to mitigate total loss, but allow yourself to fail and learn. And that's really what 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 makes that book great. Another one is um, Naval Ravikant um, uh, is Almanac. Um, unbelievable book really breaks down. Um, personal and professional, you know, what's important in your life. I think it's really a good book in the sense that so many of these books are so business focused and this really ties business and personal together because that's really essentially what it is. I mean, a business is nothing more than a, an idea, a strategy and a group of people trying to execute something. That's what a business is. So there really is so much personal tied into it. So it's not just, hey, black and white, do X and X and make money you know, it's just a byproduct of what you're trying to create and bring to society, right? So by not just being so business focused only, and also being focused on on tying business and uh, personal together, I just thought it was an incredible read um, about, you know, what's important to you in life, how you want to live your life, what what really are your goals, really, based on what you might think they are, is your goal really to make X amount of money? Well, if it is, why? Right? What does that get you to? What do you achieve once you get that much money? And then two, he, he really breaks down like, you know, the ways in w which to create wealth in a really simple way. I think that anyone can really understand, um, you know, the ways to, to utilize leverage, whether it be technology leverage, you know, human leverage, capital leverage um, in order to, you know, get a specific result. Really, really, really good book. Um, 
I, and, and then again, I, it's hard for me to answer your question too, because really it depends on what subject I've read books in a lot of different varieties of subjects. So if you're talking about business, there's like, there's out a bit real estate books. I, there's best ones, history books. I mean, um, really depends on kind of what you're, you know, what somebody really wants to learn. I have both of those books behind me on my bookshelf. I have principles and Naval's almanac. I think, oh, good. I think Naval's almanac might be my favorite book of all time. I think it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's really, really good. I think it, it's definitely in my top three, if if not number one. What's your what is your number one? I, I think I'd say Naval. I think I would okay, say that's number what, one. What, what's, what would you say is number two? Uh, I have to go with my background before I got into real estate was in stock investing. I was a just a disciple of Warren Buffett, read every single thing I ever could from him, went out to Omaha. So I'd have to say like security analysis, the intelligent investor, kind of his staple books of of stock investing are are definitely up there for me yeah this is also a good one for anybody that's watching the video um it's called how to get rich by felix dennis um sam parr if you know who sam parr is uh host of my first million uh he says this is his favorite book of all time and i really like sam him and i kind of see things a lot alike in in business and kind of life so i was like oh i should pick up that book i'm only like 100 pages in but um i've liked it so far um, another one I have next to me, I haven't read it yet, but I've heard really great things is this, um, it's called company of one by Paul Jarvis. Um, I've heard that that's a really good book as well. I read, I read that one. That's a good one. Yeah. I've heard that's great. So, um, I like a lot of different books. Um, two books on business I thought were really, really useful. Mastering the Rockefeller habits and scaling up by Vern Harnish. I think those are the most, I think those have got to be some of the best business books that are out there on just how to build and run a company, um, you know, and, and, and create efficiency and then how to scale once, how to scale the company once there's, you know, product market fit or success or whatever, how do you, how do you grow it efficiently so that you're able to stay work on the business versus in the business and really like, you know, really mapping that out in a, such a simple in simple ways that are practical and, and can be implemented. It's just, it's really, really are great books. I try to almost, skim through them every couple of years to make sure that, that I'm, you know, still thinking through these things and applying a lot of these techniques. Yeah. I haven't heard of the, that one or those two. I'll have to, I'll have to check them out. You've also said that you trade focus, you would trade focus over intelligence any day of the week. And I just mentioned in the reading example, how I briefly, like I, I kind of struggle with focus and I've had some really great conversations about it. I still seem to struggle. I like to talk about it as much as I can because it's probably my biggest problem in life, business, whatever it is, is, is focus. So why do you think focus is so important and why would you choose focus over intelligence? And How do you focus? Well, number one, I, you know, I said that doesn't mean I'm that good at it. I, I identify that it's not my strength to be clear. It hasn't been, but I've recognized that because it hasn't been my strength, um, I, I've watched certain people with more focus actually achieve more than I have and looking at them and saying, you know, I could have done what they did, but I just didn't have the focus. So what I mean by that, um, what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of times, you know, look, the word compounding gets thrown out, thrown around a, a lot, but compounding relationships, compounding money, compounding, compounding, everything is, is how you create great things in life. So, you know, if you do, if you focus on one thing, for example, you might, you know, you're for a whole lifetime, just let's say you're an insurance salesman and all you do is sell insurance and you do it for 75 years, right? By the time you're 75 and if you're doing this day in, day out and you're just focused on that, you're just going to walk circles around someone that's tried five to seven or 10 different things because every time you try something brand new and you, you, you're, you're, you're tr re trying to rebuild this sort of circle of trust of people who can I trust in this environment, you, you have a learning curve, you're going to, you're going to create failure. And, and, and frankly, one of my, you know, personal downfalls that I've worked on over the years is I've enjoyed that process, right. To a, to a fault where I'm like, you know, I love this, like this, I want to explore this, like trying to see this, the, the, the perimeter of my capabilities and saying, could I take on this project? Like, could I, could I do this? And then, kind of jumping in there and um, trying to do it. But that's not necessarily the greatest way to wealth, right? It's just not, right? So, you know, that's part of what Warren Buffett, as you mentioned, 
you know, talks about a lot, right? Is just his inability, his ability to, to say no to a thousand things, right? What he means by that is focus. I mean, just think about the shiny, they, what, is, what is the expression? Shiny objects, squirrel, you know, shiny object syndrome, you know, and you're running around and there's a million things and this guy goes, what about this idea or this business idea? And then if you're a yes person, I mean, I'm a yes person. So for so long, it's like, yes, yes, let's do that. Let's get that done, you know, but it's not necessarily a recipe for, for greatness. Um, and um, so that's what I mean by that. I mean, really focusing on something for a long sustained period of time is going to give you those compounding benefits, whether it be relationships, finance, et cetera, that I think can really propel someone really in a great way. And, 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 and it's something that as I've gotten older, I've really become cognizant of. And um, that's why I say I would trade some of, I think what my, what some of my creative talents, if, if the goal was just money making, I would trade some of those just to have more focus. If the goal was just to make the most money as an example. Have you found anything that helps with your focus at all? <laughs> um, medication? No. Um, uh, <laughs> help with focus. Um, I, I, you know, honestly, it's, it's, it's been something that's really, really been tough for me. Um, I think that the number one thing that's, that I have found that has helped me change some of the some of the my inclination to, to jump into sort of shiny squirrel syndrome is um staying in alignment with my passion right making sure what i'm doing on a daily basis is enjoyable and making sure that anything i'm working on um has certain characteristics that will make that i that i that i just would do for free right that's really what you want to do. And, and, and sometimes you want to make the most money. You're going to do it by doing what you want to do for free. And just as an example of that, like a lot of my business right now has to do with, you know, fi finance and real estate. So, which I, I enjoy um, and it's very profitable, but, but a lot of what I'm, I've actually been mapping out currently is I'm not doing a lot of sales right now. And I love sales. I live for it. I love it. I started my business on it. I love selling a good product and uh, I'm not doing that at all currently and because I have a more efficient way to make money with real estate and, you know, duplicating cash flow and compounding, you know, cash flow and compounding assets and things like that. And, and it's fun. I enjoy it. But I've been, you know, thinking through that. Right. I mean, is there a way it's something I've been working on actually with with a business coach recently that we've been kind of brainstorming back and forth of like, could I have it? Could I allocate any time? to certain things that I know I will enjoy and, and, but I, but I, you know, I don't lose, you know, track of trying to continue to build wealth, but I also, you know, it's not the end all be all at the end. We're all, we all end up in the same place. You know, we can't take our money with us. So how much money do I really need to make and why? And can I, can I add things into the mix that I just enjoy, man, that I just like to do. And, um, that's, that's, that's how I think how you how you can get the most focus is making sure that you're doing something that you actually want to do for the right reasons. And you're not looking over the boat going, but I wish I was doing that. And, and you're just you just the more in alignment you can become. That's the best way to, to get focus. No real estate agent or real estate sales in your future. Uh, real estate agent or sales. Well, I mean, a real estate agent would be a good combination of sales and real estate. You'd be able to come, kind of do both your things. It doesn't really make sense for me at this stage. Um, I own and operate um, real estate and, and it's just, it's the, the problem for me and being, and being a real estate, that kind of a sale would be that, um, and I'll just, you know, frankly would be. Um, it's not worth the money. Well, not worth the money is, is one piece, but if it's, if we're taking money aside, if we're just, if we're just taking money aside from that and we just we take that completely out of the equation i don't like the concept of someone owning my time right that's a huge value for me and so with being a real estate agent um gives x amount of people access to my time when they want my time to do x and x and for me that's just not in alignment with how i how i have the vision for my life which just makes that not the type of sale that would be interesting to me so if i was to do a type of sale 
it would be something that I could continue to control my time and do the sales when I wanted to do those sales in the times that I created so that I could live the optimal life that I want to live, not dictated by others. That's the downside of that. Now, that said, nothing wrong with being a real estate agent. I'll make that clear. And someone that might be in complete alignment with what somebody loves to do. And that's great. I, I don't love, I wouldn't love that. And so that's why I don't do it. And um, that's it. And, and, but it, there's nothing wrong with that as a business at all, to be clear. You also recently tweeted about, I want to get into some of the real estate stuff. You said that the deal structure is a lot more important than the deal size. I don't really hear much people, many people talking about their structure or any like real deal structure on, on Twitter or even on podcasts or anything. Really, it's always about how many units do you own? How many units is that property that you're buying? You know, it's always unit count. It's always size. So why do you think that deal structure is more important than size and how can deal structures go wrong? Yeah, I kind of throw So, you know, sometimes on Twitter, I like to, or sometimes I'll throw out sort of vague, um, you know, open-ended sort of concepts. And then I, if people want to come in and ask questions, I'm happy to answer the questions. But, you know, as opposed to some people that are writing long, long page threads, I just don't frankly have the time. <laughs> but um, um, uh, what I... What I meant uh, by that is people get really lost in unit count or things like that, as you said, and they get lost on an ego actually comes really into play um, big time for people. But the reality is it's, it's very similar to trying to grow, for example, a venture startup too fast or things like that. And you take on too much capital, for example, at the very beginning, you're going to just give away more equity. It's really that simple. So if you're, you know, how you structure a deal, for example, assuming you're using investors money, which generally is the case, especially for some period of time when you're starting out and most of the time forever, because real estate's so capital intensive that you to grow, it's very difficult to grow to maximum level without using, you know, outside capital. But my point is, is, was that, you know, people don't pay attention to how they structure things and they just do what they, what they read on Twitter or what they general, they'll do, okay, I'll do a five, six preferred return. I'll do a 70, 30 waterfall, meaning investor gets 70%. And then they do a, you know, investor has to get their money back in five, in three to four years. And, and then, you know, if, if for example, if there's a, if there's any, you know, change in interest rates on the on the refi, or they're not able to recapture as much capital, for example, as they promised an investor, or um, the timeline is extended beyond because construction takes longer than they expected, like all those different things, um, you could completely eat up your promote or your profit um, on a deal very quickly, right? As opposed to like, you know, intelligently structuring even a smaller deal where you have, let's say, even more control or, you know, the, 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 you don't have so many investors potentially in a deal. There, one strategy, to be clear, is not better than the other at all. Um, it really depends on what you're trying, what a business is trying to do. And if a business like if you're trying to become Sam Zell or Barry Sternlet, you're going to raise a lot of money and you're going to buy a lot of assets and 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 and, and, and you're in your business plan could be is probably more around deploying the most money and getting a small percentage on a lot of capital versus a large percentage on a small deal, right? I probably make more money than a lot of these huge players in some cases per deal, but they could make money more, um, you know, as a company, but it really just depends on what it is that you want to do and, and what, what lifestyle also is, is, you know, are you trying to create along with the business? So that's really what I mean. It's just people just get lost in that and, and, and they want to do this huge apartment complex, but you could very easily give the whole thing away to investors. And, you know, you, you want to negotiate a deal too um, that really aligns you with the investor, but also gives you some wiggle room to have some things that could happen. You know, construction takes a little longer than expected, things like that. You, you, my advice is, is, to structure it's that you're just not losing the whole pie if you don't hit metrics exactly and having an investor who's understanding and aligned with with those goals and understands that listen you know there's some outside macroeconomic potential factors that that are maybe out of control that have nothing to do with you as a real estate operator if these things happen you know this is how how we're going to handle it and my participation in this transaction may look like x but doesn't necessarily mean need to look like zero 
right? And just those are the kind of structures you want to walk through and really think about or talk to a structuring attorney about or talk to a mentor about or things like that to really think about that because that's more important than, than the underlying asset in, in, in many cases because it doesn't matter what the asset looks like, the size, small, what kind of asset. It's, it's you know, is time the friend of the asset? You know, over time, is it getting better? Are rents increasing? And, and um, you know, if you have investors and there's some sort of dip or something potentially mac from a macro perspective, is your structure, do you have a structure set up that, that it's long term enough to still potentially be profitable for yourself on, on that investment? And those are the types of, of questions that, that someone building a, you know, a real real estate company, for example, is really going to want to ask themselves and, and align their goals, their personal goals and make sure their investors goals are aligned with that and the expectations are set up properly. Those are a lot of big mistakes I made younger. Let's talk about those younger days. Today, you've done over $100 million in real estate, nearly every asset class. But going back to when you were younger, when you were just getting started, how did you get your start in real estate? And what was your first real estate deal like? Uh, my first real estate deal ever. Wow. I haven't even thought about that. Didn't even know you were going to ask me that. The first real estate deal I ever did was this property in Rancho Panasquitas, California, in San Diego. And um, I just looked online and there was, a, there was a cracked slab. And so I didn't really know anything about cracked slabs or, or anything like that. But I knew at the time, because financing was so crazy, that I could buy the property with no money down because the mortgage, the mortgage industry was crazy back in 2005. So I knew I could finance it with no money. And um, so really, what I, what, all I understood was, okay, how much could I fix the slab for? And what would the property be worth if there wasn't this cracked slab issue? And, and it was really that simple in my head. I wasn't sophisticated. I didn't know much about it. And sometimes that's but a really big lesson, by the way. Sometimes keep it simple is the smartest thing you can do, especially in real estate. People overcomplicate, especially my, I've done it many times. But that was it. And actually, because I was so... What's interesting and funny about it is because I was so ignorant and novice about everything, the fact that I thought so simple was actually why this first deal was successful. Because I didn't think about anything else. I didn't know anything about anything. Prices of rehabbing a kitchen. I didn't know anything. And so... I just knew I could buy it with no money down. And I just knew that that it would be worth more if there was no foundation. And I looked at what properties that had similar square footage that didn't have foundation in the neighborhood sold for. And I could see there was, I don't remember the numbers at all, but just call it a hundred thousand dollar, you know, delta, you know, saying, okay, there's a hundred thousand dollars in profit with properties that don't have foundation. Like, okay, well. Let me just get foundation people out there to go inspect the foundation and get the quotes and figure it out. And I and I think I, and I think if I can remember correctly, I discovered that I could get the foundation done for like you know twenty five or thirty thousand. So I was like, this just this seems like a no brainer. Um, and that's what happened, and it was successful. And I fixed the foundation, and I and um, and then I flipped it, and that was my first real estate deal. Was your plan always to become kind of, I'll use this word mogul, but was like that always your focus to become a real estate mogul or was it more just like, Hey, maybe if I do a couple flips or I get a couple rental, five, six, seven rentals, that'll be financially free. Or did you always plan on like really becoming a real estate entrepreneur? Uh, I was never planning on anything at all. Actually, I was just, I got into real estate by accident because I called my neighbor because he moved into a wealthier, a nicer neighborhood than I was in. And I, when I was 18 and bored in the summer and I called him and said, Hey, let me go hang out in your office and try to figure, try to see what you do. That was how I got into real estate. I had no plans of doing it and didn't have any specific passion about real estate. Really it's business. I kind of still feel that way, to be honest. <laughs> it's really just, I like doing deals and, um, you know, I like some of the creativity that you can have around it. Um, but that was never really the plan, um, and I never had ego around it. I think money came money came a lot into the into the factor because I think I really discovered okay, money really buys you freedom. That like that was a big thing for me, and it still is, and it's 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 on my board today. Like I have the number one things of why I do what I do, constantly checking them checking in them every quarter, saying why am I doing this, and if, if I'm not if, if am I doing this for the right reasons, and if I'm not, then I need to do something else. And, um, 
freedom was a huge part. So money making and cash flow made a lot of sense to me. That was that was like the biggest thing when I was young and ignorant about even what I was doing or what I was building. I didn't know I would be a mogul or I was trying to build an empire. It was nothing like the name on a building. It still isn't like that. I don't care at all um, about you know what anyone thinks about how many assets I have. None of that really matters to me at all. It's still actually the same to me now. It's how much cash flow can I create monthly? And there's a certain net worth that gets a tie that gets tied to that, but really, essentially, what you really are after is monthly cash flow. And to this day, and everything that I've read and looked into, I just don't see another industry or business on earth that can give you the sustainable cash flow that real estate can. It's just there is just nothing like it. There is no business there. Like there is just there were not many. I mean, I don't want to say anything ignorant, but there's not many things that you could buy a property today and I could potentially pass it down for hundreds of years and it could still bring in income long after I'm gone. That is just really incredible. I mean, when you really think about that. So my thought is like, I don't want some business that like the, the world changes so fast, right? And so you get into a business that has lots of cash flow, but most businesses eventually go under or they shift or they pivot or they, they change or they're, you know, they, they're just not as constant. And so as real estate and aggregating a lot of cash flow, it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of time. Um, and, um, but once you get cash flow, it's pretty addicting because that's, there's nothing that beats that really when it comes to economics. I mean, it's just, can I pay my living expenses plus more, you know, with just monthly checks that come in the mail with, you know, making sure you have the right management in place. There's just nothing better than that. So you learned about it when you were 18. Did you go to college or did you just go right into real estate full time? I was going to community college. Um, I wasn't a very good student in high school, to be honest. Um, and uh, I was going to community college at San Diego State and um, or at Grossmont College. I was planning on transferring to SDSU. That was the plan. And then actually that, that led to my first venture. I identified with... Um, with a partner who was a Sigma Pi brother out there, a housing shortage, a major housing shortage for students. And it, it's a cool lesson, actually. I'm, I, I love this because people, people don't ask me kind of like what, what the biggest lessons of this was, because it's really interesting because at this time I knew nothing about real estate, right? I knew nothing about economics. I knew nothing about anything, right? I only knew one thing. And that one thing made this venture really successful. I knew what the students wanted exactly because I was one of them. I knew what streets they wanted to be on. I knew all the way down to what kind of houses the guys wanted to impress girls. I knew all of that. I knew they wanted jacuzzis and where and how big the backyards. I didn't have to know anything about real estate. That's a really cool maybe takeaway here, a lesson, is that was it. And so I just, everything else I was able to figure out. Okay, how does construction work? How do we get a permit to take this house and turn it from three bedrooms into seven bedrooms? Um, how do we add pools? You know, how do we get the right bank financing? You know, how do we get investors? Like everything else was just how, 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 but it was all centered around a really simple real estate concept. And actually that's a really big note. Um, I think if I give any, any, any cool tidbits out is that people get lost in what real estate is, but it's really just a business, right? It's, it's really just, do people want your product, right? Like, do people want to be where you're at? And are, are more people going to come there over time? That's it, right? If you buy a shopping, you know, or a, like, you know, you're on a, on a street and there you have a, a, a small shopping center, you know, and are people moving, more people moving into this area that are going to need to use your shopping center? Or is there a reason why they'll go somewhere else? And that alone is what dictates the success of your asset, Right. That's it. I mean, obviously there's, you know, government, you know, subsidies and all these different things on a macro perspective that come in and might give you some tailwinds and help with help or hurt your asset in the short term. But over the long term, like what do you own? What are you renting it for? And is that is that specific property going to be in higher demand tomorrow than it is today? And like that's just that's what you want to know. I mean, that's really what you're solving for. And if you can solve for that and you keep your debt low, you're going to make a lot of money in real estate. If you just understand those couple principles, right? Like what's going to do well here long term and can you withstand can can you withstand any flux, market fluctuations in the in the meantime and hang on? 
That's it. Those are the two things. If you can get those two things right, everything else you'll figure out what bank to call investor. I mean, everything else is just will be figured out. When you say low debt, when you say low debt, what do you mean? Like low loan to value? And if so, what, what LTV do you go to? 65, 70, 50, lower? Um, look, there's not a formula that just makes all the sense in the world. I think that, you know, if you want to use a quantifiable number, let's say, let's try to stay under 70, 65% always, um, preferably under 60, 60, 65, and, and maybe you're not juicing returns to the maximum and you're there, but really, you know, you want to look at your, but really that's just a number to look at. What you really also, what you want to look at is like, you know, what's the word? Um, um, stress test. Um, you know, you want to say, look, I own an apartment building with a hundred units, right? Like what's, what has to happen for me not to pay my debt? Right. So forget the 65% number. So, so use that as a basis. Right. But after you figure out, okay, I'm at 65%. Now there might be protections there because if the market goes down, you have to sell, there might still be equity because it's not likely to go down more than 35%. So from that aspect, that's why that metric might matter. But really what matters more is how many units can go vacant and how much can the rent go down before you just cannot pay your mortgage. Right. Is it 80%? you know, occupied, if it's a hundred units, is it 80 units? Is it 70? Is it 60? You know, um, how much can rents go down? They do go down, right? Or else it doesn't just always go up all the time, right? Over time it does in a good area, but it might have down years. And so that's really what you want to com- be comfortable with and try to be conservative because, and the point is, is you're better off being conservative than trying to maximize returns. Because if you just stay in the game over time, you're going to be rich, right? Not trying to make 30, 40% and going bankrupt every seven or eight years. That's not the way to to winning in real estate. You're better off making moderate returns, you know, making investors happy, tailoring expectations and just not losing money, right? That's it. And if you can do that, you've got a really good recipe. You've got a really good formula. You've been in a bunch of different asset classes. Which ones have been your favorites? And which ones have been kind of your least favorites? Uh, well, number one, I think that that people, you know, there's a lot of learning curve in every asset class. So, so, so statement one is you really got to get to know certain ones. So people might favorite industrial, for example, more than I do because they just might understand it better. I've got a friend who just is just so unbelievably successful in industrial real estate. And I just don't really understand it that well. He understands the shortages, the areas where, you know, where this tra- where um, transport needs to go and how close to city, how close to, you know, uh, whatever warehouses that, that, you know, that Amazon or whatever it is, he just understands all the things that make that real estate valuable and why he believes that will continue to be valuable over time. Whereas I don't necessarily understand that. So I really like housing. You know, and I've played around in all kinds of different asset classes. You know, I've done uh, commercial retail. I've bought office buildings. Um, I've I've even done an industrial building that I've leased to uh, cannabis tenants. That I built one of the first cannabis campuses in California. Um, and um, I've just done a lot of the variety. And what I what I love about housing is, look, the challenge with housing is it's no secret, right? What I'm saying is just not a secret. Everyone knows that, you know, someone needs a place to live. It's just the best asset class. It just really is in terms of like long-term safety, but there's risk adjusted return associated with it. So there's, you're not going to necessarily make the returns you would make maybe on another, another asset, which could have a higher level of risk. Um, but, but look, I like housing and apartments a lot. Um, I think that you can, with a lot of confidence, for example, I just think San Diego just as one example, will just be better and better over time. Um, I'm sitting in Pacific beach right now and I'm looking out the window and there's, there's a a beautiful beach and people coming from all over the world. And every year people make money, they come here because they just want to be here and people find ways to get here and they find ways to leave other places. Right. So, you know, housing and places where people are trying to leave like Flint, Michigan, Flint, Michigan didn't, didn't get any of the upside of this whole big market run up at all. Um, 
everyone wanted to leave the second if you have any money you live in flint michigan you're out right so housing is not going to save you if you don't have demand but you know in san diego i just show me anywhere in san diego and people are going to want to come to this climate right? i just i believe that and i could be wrong right but i'm willing to bet on it i'm willing to bet that people will always come and the population of san diego will continue to increase no matter what dumb politicians because there's plenty of them right now come into power to make all kinds of crappy rules and regulations at the end of the day people are coming to this amazing city and, and enjoying the sunshine and the beaches it's just that's just that to me is just something I'm willing to bet on for the rest of my life. That was going to be my next, my next exact question was you don't mind investing in the California laws? Not at all. In fact, well, what, what California laws are you talking about specifically? I am not, honestly, I'm not an expert on California law at all. Like I don't, I don't invest there. I just kind of avoid there. I've been there a couple of times as a vacationer or a traveler, but um, I've just, you always hear that California has really strict or, or poor laws for landlords. They're really tenant friendly. They're not great for real estate investors. So I'm just, there's just kind of that stigma around California. And all that's true. Um, but a, a, a couple notes on that, right? So, you know, back in 2008, I ventured to Texas and I thought it was really cool that the zoning was so, was so, was so lax because I could basically do whatever I wanted and not have much of a headache, Right. That's, that was a young man's thought, right? But like, as I've gotten older, like the tight regulations, for example, starting with zoning, really are to your benefit because there might be a high barrier to entry and it might be hell, for example, to go through Coastal Commission, but you know how much value you're creating once you get through. And you, can, and you can have confidence that those laws and regulations have more durability when, there's, when there is regulations, right? So number one, regulations just aren't all bad because if there's a moat around your business or your real estate, meaning it has its defensibility and it can't just change the next day or someone can't just build whatever they want next door because it's just very difficult. It just makes your property more valuable. So that's number one. Um, you know, as far as taxes go, that's a nightmare, right? Um, but again, do whatever you want with the taxes and people find a way to come here. You know, people leave and they yell and scream. And then they come and they come to San Diego and they just go, oh, I'll pay these tax. It's just, there's just always going to be a demographic that's willing to do that always in my, in my view, because just, it's so, it's so amazing. Um, so that's one. And uh, two tenant, uh, with respect to your question on tenants, I mean, yes, that's true. Uh, not landlord friendly, friendly. It just, it makes your, it makes life more difficult, but it's not impossible, Right. You might take longer to evict tenants. It might be more expensive to evict tenants, but those are all things you can sort of, you know, um, at least budget for, right? Say, listen, this might take two years to evict a tenant, right? Or so things like that. You can, you can sort of say, listen, like there, I'm creating this much, I'm creating enough value that, that it still makes sense. And there might be a bit of a headache associated with that. But it's not like they, but they can't, they can't legally say, Hey, there's no eviction and no one has to pay rent forever. I mean, COVID was a big problem, right? And that, that sort of exaggerated what you're talking about, the reputation, because California took pretty extreme stances and no one has to pay rent. And it's kind of like, Hey, what the hell? Right. But that's, that was, that was an aberration, right? COVID was a true aberration. That's not every day. And like it was, it was COVID created a very big excuse culture in my view, right? It, it just, it enabled people to say, okay, um, we're allowed to say no one has to pay rent. It just gave these these politicians ammo to just allow things that are just completely absurd. Which which an example would be no one has to pay rent. So I don't I don't subscribe to the future of real estate in California being where like no one has to pay rent. It's just a silly thing to think about, and just there's get there there will always be laws that people have to pay for the places they stay in, and the and and eviction courts and things like that might be terrible, but there's always going to be rules and regulations that people have to just pay for what they what they signed up for. It's just ludicrous to think that this temporary excuse culture was going to last forever. And I'm not to be clear, I'm not saying any of it wasn't warrantable and and there wasn't issues on landlord sides too. I mean, it goes both ways, you know. There had to be some sensibility for tenants and sensibility for landlords. It was a really tough thing during COVID to to make sure that everyone was thought thought about, you know, and there was sensibility for both sides. It, it was very difficult. We've made it through COVID now for the most part, but now we have 
an interesting real estate market, I'd say. A lot of inflation, a lot of other issues. A lot of people are worried about a market crash, et cetera. So interesting time to be investing. How are you approaching this this market, both from an interest rate perspective, inflation? Are you buying deals? Are you worried about a crash? Are you holding tight and kind of waiting to see what happens? Like, How are you navigating the, the waters right now? I mean, you know, every year I get older, I realize more and more how much the macro environment isn't as isn't relevant if you're in the game long term. And the reason why is because you have to focus on things you can predict, right? And really, this is something we've all learned from Warren Buffett, right? Because he makes it really clear. Okay, here's the best investor in the world that says he's never once discussed with Charlie Munger. He says this. He says, not once. We have never once discussed macroeconomics. That is, think about how crazy that is, right? How could they be deploying billions of dollars in all kinds of industries and not even had one discussion about what's going on with Trump or Biden or this or like, or, 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 you know, China coming in? And it's like, how do you not have that as a factor? And then the way he breaks it down, as I've, it took me so many years, frankly, to, I'm almost embarrassed for how long it's taken me to really understand this. But the reality is the reason why it doesn't matter is because you, it, it's an impossible game. So you got to choose what game you can play, what, what game you want to play. Like you, you, if you're in the game of trying to predict macroeconomics, like get out of here, right? Like maybe Ray Dalio has been the closest thing, but like it's just – it's just not realistic that you're going to you're going to say next year this is going to happen okay i listen did i predict that covid was going to double the the like almost double my asset value here in san diego and i was going to be able to get cash out refinances at 3% no i thought i was going to lose all i thought we were totally up you know whatever like you know it just how could i have predicted that right and all of a sudden now and now we're in this big inflationary environment because the government came in and and injected you know everything with this much capital like how how was I supposed to predict every single bit of that, right? So the point I'm making is if you spend your time trying to do that, it's just an impossible feat. So what you want to do is you want to focus on, on what you can control. And what you can control in any, in any real estate environment is how much debt are you willing to put on a property and what your payment is, okay? That's one. That's in your control. Number two, what are you paying for a property, right? What kind of property are you buying? And is that property something that's likely um, to have more people in it today or have a higher demand in the future? And again, even that's not guaranteed, but here's what, here's what, what you almost can come close, you can get the closest to guaranteeing. I can't guarantee in three years that the rents will go up by X in San Diego. I just can't, even though I think that they will, but there is no guarantee. They could go down for some period of time for some reason, right? But you, but what I can bet on is that in 10 or 15 years, they will be up. So you want to set up your real estate structure with that in mind, right? So that's something I keep in mind. Now, that said, it's not an easy time right now. It really isn't. I mean, if you were, if you were operating in 2009, I mean, you were picking assets. If you, if you had capital in 2009, you had the right money behind you. I mean, game over. You're picking up assets for pennies on a dollar and they're flying from banks. And I mean, I couldn't believe what was going on. And honestly, I didn't, I did not um, capitalize in the way I even could have. It's crap. It just, it drives me nuts now because what a, an opportunity. And I, I, I took it for granted because I just was like, I didn't even realize how ridiculously good it was, even though I took a lot of opportunity and I, I did very well off of it, but I could have just been way, you know, more intense at that time. But anyways, um, it's tough right now because you've got this this inflationary environment where asset prices in a lot of cases are artificially high because of injected capital and and interest rates that have been artificially kept low and um, um, the there's not a lot of pain from sellers yet there's like a lot of their interest rates are still locked in low so so you've got this environment where um, even as the interest rates have ticked up, making the returns tougher, the the prices for the most part haven't come down proportionately um, in a lot of cases. So the guys, people that I know that are doing the best, like people that I look up to and mentors of mine, really, um, they're not really focused on any of that. They're just focused on where 
there's a big shortage where the demand is and how do they capitalize on that from sort of a microeconomic perspective and how do they get to know these local markets in a really efficient way and how do they create relationships potentially locally with brokers etc to really be the people that get those opportunities that's the people that are that are making moves they're not sitting around thinking about timing they're thinking about the asset th thinking about what assets and 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 how they want to play and and they and they have focus on it who are those people that you look up to who are you mentoring who do you follow who do you like to learn from um Well, I think that people that you don't know, I mean, I think following Barry Sternlet, following Sam Zell, um, you know, following Jonathan Gray of Blackstone, I mean, what they're doing is just, just really blows your mind. So any, any opportunity you have to read about what they're doing or what their thesis is or why they believe what they believe, I mean, they're just on another, they're just on another planet and another level than everybody else, frankly. Um, they just are. So that, that's one. And I just, I have close friends um, that I've built over the years that some of, you know, many of which have had completely alternative real estate strategies and there's really no competitive nature, right? I've got a friend, um, and you know, I'm not going to mention any names out of respect, obviously on this podcast, but for example, I've got, you know, a really good friend that, that has just done absolutely incredible with shopping centers. And, um, I, you know, I, I just learned a lot from him. I've got another friend that's just absolutely doing millions and millions of square feet of industrial space. And I understand, and I see the way he evaluates and how his company makes decisions and how his capital is structured so that he doesn't, you know, go down. So anyways, that's, um, that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, those are the things I'm doing big. That's a big, big one too. I mean, you should always get mentors and, and what's amazing is people are willing to help. I mean, in fact, someone reached out to me on Twitter actually recently. I'm scared to say this now because I don't want a million people flooding my Twitter, but because I don't, I don't have unlimited time. But someone did reach out to me um, and just asked me to, to give them some basic tips, um, a job or whatever. And um, it's it's funny how rare actually that happens. I never I get almost nothing. Not, I don't get a lot of that. And uh, I I called them back and I talked to them for half an hour. Um, and I was happy to do it. I, I didn't want anything in return. I was happy to to just give good karma. And I, I, you know, he did his research on me. That's a good advice, by the way. It wasn't ego for me, um, and maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit, to be honest. But I really liked that he did the research. You know, he really knew. He knew like my background. He didn't just say, "Oh, you're, you know, this guy on Twitter." He's like, you know, you have done X, 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 and X. And I've listened to like two of your podcasts that you've been interviewed on and things like that. Like, this is like, these are the specific questions. That was what really got me to the table, to be honest. It wasn't like an obnoxious message of like, how do I get rich or like something stupid? You know, it was like, it was like, how do I like do these things? And why'd you do this? And I was like, that's a great question. I'll take, no one's ever asked me that actually. I'll tell you exactly why I did that. You know? So anyways, I, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's a good one. You know, do the research on someone's background and bio before you reach out and you can really get incredible mentorship. Don't just approach them and say, mentor me. Say, listen, you've done these things. It's incredible. Back, you know, these days, here, here's what I know about it. And here's how I think you should approach something. I have to say, you're probably going to get a few messages from people. Uh, I've been told from other guests on the show that even some who have been on a lot of podcasts that my show is the one that they get the most interaction from with the audience. They get the most emails, DMs, whatever it is. So uh, yeah, your Twitter might might get flooded a little bit. Okay, well, I'll tell you one thing I would love because one thing I'm trying to learn from this um, or personally is I don't really have the inclination to build any business around teaching or coaching or anything like that. It's just not something that really turns my wheels. However, you know, I see a lot of crappy education or get rich quick and like all these different programs and just there are very there are legitimate ones out there for sure but there's a lot of just total bs um out there and um you know it, it bothers me a lot right that someone's going to sign up for these stupid courses and get screwed and then you watch the guy driving a lamborghini because he sold some idiot a course like that really really bothers me i worked so hard to get to where i'm at 
And uh, that drives me crazy. So I certainly at some point would like to do a better job, you know, reaching more audiences at scale. In fact, that's the reason why I'm on this podcast and I agreed to do this in the first place. I don't have any actual um, like hope of achieving anything from this podcast or any outcome at all. It's simply you asked me to do it and um, I thought it would be, why would I not, you know, take a little bit of time to give back to, to, to an audience that's as respectful as yours. I mean, you really built an awesome big audience and, and so it enables me to, to, to do that and I'm happy to do it and it feels good to do that. And so I'm certainly open to that in the future. I'd love to, to, to do more of that as I get older. How can I give back and, and do it at scale so that I, and I just, I don't want any money from it or I don't, I don't, I want nothing to do with it. I just love to give away for free what people are buying for. <laughs> I just, it's something I want to do. Just get rid of all the courses and shut everyone's course down by just saying, look, here, it's free. Enjoy, you know, do your thing. So that's on my list. I, I just don't know how to do that yet, but I'm open to marketers telling me how to do it. I'm open to it. Well, hey, Brendan, I appreciate you taking valuable, valuable time out of your day to join me. As we wrap up the show, why don't we give everybody listening a chance to follow you? Tell tell them where the best place is to find you. Oh yeah, no, thank you. Um, Twitter is the best place to find me, um, and where I'm posting any good content. My Instagram is probably just funny stuff. Um, my Twitter is Brandon M Blum. Um, so follow me there at at Brandon M Blum. M as in Michael. Blum is in B L U M. Um, and, um, hopefully I can provide, you know, more value again. I, 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 I don't tweet for any specific purpose. I'll just, I'll have a thought and I'll, I'll, I'll ship it out. And, um, so, you know, that's, uh, I'm, um, I'm always, I'm always, uh, open to any ideas on, on any other relevant content. People have reached out to me and said, Hey, I really look getting a lot from this post or whatever. Can you do more like it? And that's been an incentive for me to do it many times. So, um, yeah. And thank you so much for having me. I'm honored and privileged to be on the show. And, um, thank you for, for, uh, for interviewing me and, and giving me the opportunity to, uh, to have an awesome conversation. Next time I want to interview you so I can learn more about your world. That's the only thing that this is not, I don't normally do all the talking. I'm the guy asking a thousand questions to be clear. That's why I'm, I'm the, I annoy people with how many questions I ask. I mean, so this is not, this is very rare for me. So maybe I get the opportunity at some point to drill you. I'd love to hear about how you build a successful podcast like this. So I didn't get that opportunity. So maybe you give me that in the future. I'd love to learn. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, we'll I'll definitely have to do that. For anybody that's interested in connecting with Brandon, I'll put his contact info, Instagram, Twitter, everything, uh, his website for his real estate business, everything in the show notes for anybody that's interested in connecting with him there. Brandon, thanks seriously so much for your time. I appreciate you joining me. Hey, thank you. Talk soon. Uh, That's how we kind of learned what the syndication was at a higher level, got the gist of what the next steps were, which for us were to start a thought leadership platform, which is where you can act as a credible person in the space that you're looking to break into. And for us, that was creating a podcast kind of like you have here. And also 